Welcome back to another episode of Mike Reads. Tonight we'll be continuing in our series on Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson with Chapter 16, which is entitled, quote-unquote, Stabilizing Commodities. As I've mentioned throughout the course of this series, we're doing this series as a parallel read with Thomas Sowell's Economic Facts and Fallacies, so I'll put a link in this video's description to that series so you can follow along there as well. As I've also mentioned throughout the course of this series, we will be doing an analysis and review at the end of each read, so I'll put a timestamp in this video's description so you can jump straight to that part of the video if that's how you'd like to go about this. As I've also mentioned throughout some of these reads um, in Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, uh, this read is broken up into two parts. They are labeled solely numerically, um, and there is no label for part one, so I'll be inserting part one uh, after the chapter title. So with all that out of the way, let's dive on into tonight's read, which is chapter 16, quote-unquote, stabilizing commodities, part one. Attempts to lift the prices of particular commodities permanently above their natural market levels have failed so often so disastrously and so notoriously that sophisticated pressure groups and the bureaucrats upon whom they apply the pressure seldom openly avow that aim. Their stated aims, particularly when they are first proposing that the government intervene, are usually more modest and more plausible. They have no wish, they declare, to raise the price of commodity X permanently above its natural level. That, they concede, would be unfair to consumers but it is now obviously selling far below its natural level. The producers cannot make a living. Unless we act promptly, they will be thrown out of business. Then there will be a real scarcity, and consumers will have to pay exorbitant prices for the commodity. The apparent bargains that the consumers are now getting will cost them dear in the end, for the present quote-unquote temporarily low prices cannot last. But we cannot afford to wait for so-called natural market forces or for the quote-unquote blind law of supply and demand to correct the situation. For by that time, the producers will be ruined and a great scarcity will be upon us. The government must act. All that we really want to do is to correct these violent, senseless fluctuations in price. We are not trying to boost the price. We are only trying to stabilize it. There are several methods by which it is commonly proposed to do this. One of the most frequent is government loans to farmers to enable them to hold their crops off the market. Such loans are urged in Congress for reasons that seem very plausible to most listeners. They are told that the farmers' crops are all dumped on the market at once, at harvest time, that this is precisely the time when prices are lowest, and that speculators take advantage of this to buy the crops themselves and hold them for higher prices when food gets scarcer again. Thus it is urged that the farmers suffer and that they, rather than the speculators, should get the advantage of the higher average price. This argument is not supported by either theory or experience. The much reviled speculators are not the enemy of the farmer. They are essential to his best welfare. The risks of fluctuating farm prices must be borne by somebody. They have in fact been borne in modern times chiefly by the professional speculators. In general, the more competently the latter act in their own interest as speculators, the more they help the farmer. For speculators serve their own interests precisely in proportion to their ability to foresee future prices. But the more accurately they foresee future prices, the less violent or extreme are the fluctuations in prices. Even if farmers had to dump their whole crop of wheat on the market in a single month of the year, therefore, the price in that month would not necessarily be below the price at any other month, apart from an allowance for the cost of storage. For speculators, in the hope of making a profit, would do most of the buying, their buying at that time. They would keep on buying until the price rose to a point where they saw no further opportunity of future profit. They would sell whenever they thought there was a prospect of future loss. The result would be to stabilize the price of farm commodities the year round. It is precisely because of a professional class of speculators exists to take these risks that farmers and millers do not need to take them. The latter can protect themselves through the markets. Under normal conditions, therefore, when speculators are doing their, doing their job well, the profits of farmers and millers will depend chiefly on their skill and in industry in farming or milling, and not on market fluctuations. 
Actual experience shows that on average, the price of wheat and other non-perishable crops remains the same all year round, except for for an allowance for storage, interest, and insurance charges. In fact, some careful investigations have shown that the average monthly rise after harvest time has not been quite sufficient to pay such storage charges, so that the speculators have actually subsidized the farmers. This, of course, was not their intention. It has simply been the result of a persistent tendency to over-optimism on the part of speculators. This tendency seems to affect entrepreneurs in most competitive pursuits. As a class, they are constantly, contrary to intention, subsidizing consumers. This is particularly true wherever the prospects of big speculative gains exist. Just that the subscribers to a lottery, considered as a unit, lose money because each is unjustifiably hopeful of drawing one of the few speculator prizes. It has been calculated that the total value of the labor and capital dumped into prospecting for gold or oil has exceeded the total value of the gold or oil extracted. The case is different, however, when the state steps in and either buys the farmer's crops itself or lends them the money to hold the crops off the market. This is sometimes done in the name of maintaining what is plausibly called an, quote, ever-normal granary, end quote. But the history of prices in annual carryovers of crops shows that this function, as we have seen, is already been well perform- being well performed by the privately organized free markets. When the government steps in, the ever-normal granary becomes, in fact, an ever-political granary. The farmer is encouraged with the taxpayer's money to withhold his crops excessively. Because they wish to make sure of retaining the farmer's vote, the politicians who initiate the policy, or the bureaucrats who carry it out, always place the so-called fair price for the farmer's product above the price that supply and demand conditions at the time justify. This leads to a falling off in buyers. The ever-normal granary, therefore, tends to become an ever-abnormal granary. Excessive stocks are held off the market. The effects of this is to secure a higher price temporarily than would otherwise exist, but to do so only by bringing about later on a much lower price than would otherwise have existed. For the artificial shortage built up this year by withholding a part of a crop from the market means an artificial surplus next year. It would carry us too far afield to describe in detail what actually happened when this program was applied, for example, to American cotton. We piled up an entire year's crop in storage. We destroyed the foreign market for our cotton. We stimulated enormously the growth of cotton in other countries. Though these results had been predicted by opponents of the restriction and loan policy, when they actually happened, the bureaucrats responsible for the result merely replied, that they would have happened anyway. For the loan policy is usually accompanied by, or inevitably leads to, a policy of restricting production, i.e. a policy of scarcity. In nearly every effort to quote-unquote stabilize the price of a commodity, the interests of the producers have been put first. The real object is an immediate boost of prices. To make this possible, a proportional restriction of output is usually placed on each producer subject to the control. This has several immediately bad effects. Assuming that the control can be imposed on an international scale, it means that total world production is cut. The world's consumers are able to enjoy less of that product than they would have enjoyed without restriction. The world is just that much poorer. Because consumers are forced to pay higher prices than otherwise for that product, they have just that much less to spend on other products. Part 2. The restrictionists usually reply that this drop in output is what happens anyway under a market economy. But there is a fundamental difference, as we have seen in the preceding chapter. In a competitive market, excuse me, in a competitive market economy, it is the high-cost producers the inefficient producers, that are driven out by a fall in price. In the case of an agricultural commodity, it is the least competent farmers, or those with the poorest equipment, or those working with the poorest land, that are driven out. The most capable farmers on the best land do not have to restrict their production. On the contrary, if the fall in price has been symptomatic of a lower average cost of production reflected through an increased supply, then the driving out of the marginal farmers on the marginal land enables the good farmers on the good land to expand their production. So there may be, in the long run, 
no reduction whatsoever in the output of that commodity, and the product is then produced and sold at a permanently lower price. If that is the outcome, then the consumer of that commodity will be as well supplied with it as they were before. But as a result of the lower price, they will have money left over, which they did not have before, to spend on other things. The consumers, therefore, will obviously be better off, but their increased spending in other directions will give increased employment in other lines, which will then absorb the farmer, the, sorry, absorb the formal marginal farmers in occupations in which their efforts will be more lucrative and more efficient. A uniform proportional restriction to return to our government intervention scheme means, on the one hand, that the efficient low-cost producers are not per permitted to turn out all the output they can at a low price. It means, on the other hand, that the inefficient high-cost producers are artificially kept in business. This increases the average cost of producing the product. It is being produced less efficiently than otherwise. The inefficient marginal producer, thus artificially kept in that line of production, continues to tie up land, labor, and capital that could much more profitably and efficiently be devoted to other uses. There is no point in arguing that as a result of the restriction scheme, at least the price of farm products has been raised and, quote, the farmers are more purchasing, have more purchasing power, end quote. They have got it only... They've got it only by taking just that amount, that much purchasing power away from the city buyer. We have been over all this ground before in our analysis of parity prices. To give farmers money for restricting production, or to give them the same amount of money for an artificially restricted production, is no different from forcing consumers or taxpayers to pay people for doing nothing at all. In each case, the beneficiaries of such policies get quote-unquote purchasing power. But in each case, someone else loses an exactly equivalent amount. The net loss to the community is the loss of production because people are supported for not producing. Because there is less for everybody, because there is less to go around, real wages and real incomes must decline either through a fall in their monetary amount or through higher living costs. But if an attempt is made to keep up the price of an agricultural commodity and no artificial restrictive output is imposed, unsold surpluses of the overpriced commodity continue to pile up until the market for that product finally collapses to a far greater extent than if the control program had never been put into effect. Or producers outside the restriction program, stimulated by the artificial rise in price, expand their own production enormously. This is what happened to the British rubber restriction and their American cotton restriction programs. In either case, the collapse of prices finally goes to catastrophic lengths that would never have been reached without the restriction scheme. The plan that started out so bravely to quote-unquote stabilize prices and conditions brings incomparably greater instability than the free forces of the market could possibly have brought. Yet new international commodity controls are constantly being proposed. This time, we are told, they're going to avoid all the old errors. This time, prices are going to be fixed that are quote-unquote fair, not only for producers, but for consumers. Producing and consuming nations are going to agree on just what prices these fair prices are, because no one will be unreasonable. Fixed prices will necessarily involve quote-unquote just allotments and allocations for production and consumption as among nations but only cynics will anticipate any unseemly international disputes regarding these. Finally, by the greatest miracle of all, this world of super international controls and coercions is also going to be a world of quote-unquote free international trade. Just what the government planners mean by free trade in this connection I am not sure, but we can be sure of some of the things they do not mean. They do not mean the freedom of ordinary people to buy and sell and and borrow at whatever prices or rates they like and wherever they find it most profitable to do so. They do not mean the freedom of the plain citizen to raise as much of a given crop as he wishes, to come and go at will, to settle where he pleases, to take his capital and other belongings with him. They mean, I suspect, the freedom of bureaucrats to settle these matters for him. And they tell him that if he docilely obeys the bureaucrats, he will be rewarded by a, raise, a rise in his living standards. But if the planners succeed in tying up the idea of international cooperation, 
with the idea of increased state domination and control over economic life, the, f- the international controls of the future seem only too likely to follow the pattern of the past, in which case the plain man's living standards will decline with his liberties. That concludes tonight's read. Now on to the analysis and review part of the video. All right, welcome to the analysis and review part of the video. So this chapter is a, is the penultimate chapter in his multi-chapter series on commodities exchange. And this is, without a doubt, I think the most complicated chapter in the entire read. This book, the Economics in One Lesson, was designed to be basically an introductory read into the world of economics. Uh, Hazlitt makes it explicitly clear uh, in his um, epilogue his, his, on further reading, if you will. But the whole point of this chapter, because this may have been confusing to some folks, the whole point of this fact, this chapter, is just the mere obfuscation of the definition of the word stabilization. Stabilization is just a word that's being used as a placeholder for artificial increases in prices. So in this case, so that's basically the entire lesson of the chapter. But to, to delve into some of the points that may not have that were made, but may, may not have been quite so obvious. Let's start with the with speculators. Speculators buying crops at um, at the time of harvest when prices are low um, are buying them at that time when prices are low because of the fact that if uh, if you have to if you can sell all of your grain when it's time to harvest, you don't have to pay for storage, which means that you have an incentive as a producer to lower the price then so you don't have to assume as as great a cost cost of storage at later times. Uh, As a result, two of the of uh, the a shortage of supply that is inherently going to happen as the supply tends to sell out. Let's say we're talking about, again, grain. And let's say the harvest of the grain happens in, I don't know, October. That, and let's say that you can't harvest anything again until October of the following year. Well, that means that in July, whatever supplies of grain are, are extant are going to be existing in a, um, in a shortage of supply. Uh, and when you have a shortage of supply, when demand is above equilibrium, right? When the quantity of demand stays the same, but the quantity of supply declines, you tend to get a, an increase in price. And we've talked about this before. Uh, I'll link to a video I put together on the law of demand on my other channel that goes into greater depth on that matter. But But that's all that's going on here. So speculators are saying that we can get a higher price later on in the year. So what we'll do is we'll buy all of the crops at once uh, at the time of harvest in the hopes that we can get a higher price later. And we, we will specialize in doing nothing but buying all the crops at once and in bulk. Excuse me. And then specialize in uh, the, the, the infrastructure necessary for uh, not only storage, but the sales and marketing of the product at a different time of year. So in this case, the, the farmer can focus on doing the thing that he's very good at doing and not have to consider anything related to storage, long-term sales strategies, no winter investments, and there's and, and assumes no waste costs too in the event that you wind up holding crops off the market for so long that they, they spoil. Uh, everything has a shelf life to a certain extent, therefore... Uh, at some point, these crops are just going to have to get thrown away if they get held out held out for too long. And the in the what, what speculators do is they absorb those costs. So this is a cost th- uh, basis that farmers don't have to involve themselves with. And there's also a human capital element when it comes to farming that they don't have to involve involve themselves with too. And that is the the notion the notion of the do it all versus speculation. So, uh, sorry, versus specialization. <clears throat> so when you have uh, two very different things, for example, building a long-term sales strategy, uh, winter investments, and storage, this is substantially different from the growing of crops and the harvesting of crops, and then the sale at harvest of those crops, which means you have to invest time, skill, money to developing that skill, that further skill, 
which means it's time taken away from developing the skill that's involved with the actual farming. This is a huge part of Smith's lesson um, that, and basically is the entire argument, the entire point of the entire f- first book of The Wealth of Nations. I'll link to that series because uh, I actually read The Wealth of Nations on this channel. I'll link to that in this video's description as well, so you guys can check that out. But the point is that when you have specialization, you have an improvement in human capital in a specific field that allows the, the greatest uh, efficiency to be realized in that field so long as you, on top of specialization, have a free market. And I'll give the example that I, I had experience with when I was doing landscaping. I was doing landscaping with a landscaping company down south. We didn't have all that many clients. And we did a few things extremely well. And what my boss kept wanting us to do is expand our uh, our field of service rather than expand our customer base in the in the things that we did very well and in the the fields in which we made the greatest money. And in fact, the things in which we made the greatest money are the things where we have the highest profit margin. And I explained in a previous video, I don't know which video that is, so I'll have to do some research on it and see if I can link that into this video. But the point is that profit is nothing more than an indicator of where to be investing your time. As in, you do the one thing so well that consumers are willing to pay an exorbitant price for it. That's where they're willing to uh, direct their resources, which is an indicator that you should be directing your resources to that thing. If there's something that you're losing money on and it's not a complimentary loss leader, um, there are things like, which I'll get into in just a minute, then you should be doing the other thing. You should be cutting ties with that sort of thing. So we were doing irrigation. We were doing uh, chemical treatments. We were doing... Uh, sod, uh, sod, sod renovations. We were doing tree shrub treatments. We were doing general maintenance. He was trying to get into light, uh, light masonry. We only had a crew of about five or six guys. And I'm skilled in all of those things, but I'm kind of a rare exception to the rule in that case. Most guys who know how to cut grass do basically nothing but cut grass. And in doing so, not only are they good at the cutting of the grass, they've become good at pitching the sale of the cutting of the grass. They learn to know what it is that it takes to turn a profit in these sort of fields. We weren't doing that. We were expanding into more and more types of service rather than expanding the service we were already doing into other customers because there were certain things we did that were just far and above in terms of quality, what other companies were doing. And then there were certain things where we were basically staying one chapter ahead of the class on where we were going on, we, we said, we okay, let's do this, and then we're going to go on to YouTube and stay, again, one chapter ahead of the class in, in order to get the job done and over with. And we weren't the, the absolute best in that field. So what we should have done is focused on the things that we were doing really, really well, expand our depth of knowledge in those fields so we could do even better, and then try to expand our reach rather than our, so it so the depth of our market hold rather than the width of it. Um, so in the end, all of these stabilization measures are just a redirection of consent, which again is something that is an element of Smith's lesson. So in this case, instead of spending our resources, all these stabilization policies in terms of politics are just um, are just are just basically a redirecting of where consumers where producers are willing to agree to ter- to a certain set of terms. In the end all they do is force uh, in the end all they do is force a rising in the price without a corresponding increase in productivity, which is what the exchange medium represents. So when you ca- raise the price of something artificially without increasing the production that backs that price, then all you've done is effectively inflated the value of the medium of exchange, which means that prices are, for all intents and purposes, going to increase for everything. Uh, if, if, if somebody is getting paid $7 an hour or $10 an hour and then arbitrarily gets a pay raise of $15 an hour that is handed down from the state, let's say, and it's not something that is just a purely consensual transaction between the, the basic, basically the consumer and the employee because that's all that's really happening here <clears throat> because the consumer is by paying prices uh, giving indicators to the the 
the producer, the owner of the company, landscaping company, let's say, as to how how much money that they're willing to pay that landscaping company, and therefore how much money they're willing to the landscaping company ought to be willing to pay its employees. If that if the state comes in and just artificially floats those prices, well, all they've really done because there's no increase in productivity is forced an artificial increase in in the supply of the medium of exchange that is happening between the consumer and the producer. In this case, U.S. currency. What that means is that you're going to have to just pump out tons and tons of cash from nothing. And thus, since you have increased, artificially increased the supply of, in this case, cash, the value which that cash represents declines. Because if we're using $10 to represent, say, an hour of labor at landscaping versus $15 an hour to represent an hour of landscaping labor. If nothing's changed about that, you haven't actually increased the underlying value of that. The other thing that happens is by keeping by keeping the less efficient producers afloat, you're exposing consumers to these less efficient producers. And I'll give you the example of what that what that means. In seventh grade, I had a biology teacher who was the best science teacher I ever had. Uh, and I, in all of my K through 12 education and all of my graduate education and all my postgraduate education, the best science teacher I ever had and arguably the best teacher, possibly the best teacher I ever had, period. And it is a shame that it, and when I was in seventh grade, only a quarter of the students were exposed to her. Instead, they had some other biology teacher. And what that means is that if you could somehow wave a magic wand and expose all of those students to only my seventh grade biology teacher, they would have gotten a better experience in the classroom and you would expect improved educational outcomes as a result. Hazlitt goes on to actually explain exactly this effect on pages 114 through 115 when he says, A uniform proportional restriction to return to our government intervention scheme means, on the one hand, that the efficient low-cost producers are not permitted to turn out all the output they can at a low price. It means, on the other hand, that the inefficient high-cost producers are artificially kept in business. This increases the average cost of producing the product. It is being produced less efficiently than otherwise. The inefficient marginal producer thus artificially kept in that line of production, continues to tie up land, labor, and capital that could be used much more profitably and and much, that could, excuse me, much more profitably and efficiently be devoted to other uses, which could be simply just being bought out by the other farm who has made some technological leap in how they, how they harvest or or grow or cultivate their wheat. Um, and as a result, can afford to sell that wheat at a lower price. What you would rather do is have that that one farm buy, basically buy out the other farm, and have all of the all of the wheat being produced by the same people, but at a lower cost. And the the whole point of this entire lesson uh, is further exta- explained in one sentence on page one fifteen. The net loss to the community is the loss of production because our, because people are supported for not producing. As in, these other businesses that are not being as productive or as efficient in their production are being artificially kept afloat. So that loss in productivity is being paid for. For that matter, if you had a fa- it's 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 an opportunity cost that represents basically the sitting the pay basically the paying for people to sit on their hands. The result is on page one fifteen. Real wages and real incomes must decline either through a fall in their monetary amount which is what we talked about with the uh, in, in the fall of the value of the medium of exchange, or through higher living costs, which is effectively the same thing. Um, so that's basically the entire read here in one lesson. Or sorry, that's been the analysis of, of chapter 16. Uh, it, the commodities exchange sections here are a little bit more complicated than the entire rest of the book. And I suppose I could get into greater detail, but again, this is supposed to just be an introductory read. Um, So that's where we're going to leave things off here in terms of the analysis of that chapter. And uh, we'll continue in with this read with chapter 17, uh, with with chapter 17, government price fixing, when we return to this read. So until then, this has been Mike, signing off.